What you are about to see is a look into the collector's world of model horses. This is a world of serious artists and collectors, and most of them will tell you all of these models are not just plastic horses. What draws anyone to collecting? Um, I think it's in your blood. If you're a collector, you're a collector. And if you love horses, it might be model horses. Um, if you love dishes, it might be dishes. You know, it just depends on what's in your, in your heart. If you really love something, you want to hold it in your hand. It's, it's as basic as a little boy wanting to hold a car in his hand, uh, to even religion, wanting to hold a cross or some icon in your hand close to your heart, have it in your room where you couldn't bring a car or a horse. I'm one of those, uh, one of those people that came out of the womb pretending I was a horse, you know, jumping over laundry baskets at home in the hallway and, and galloping, you know, to the school bus. So I've always been very horsey. And I've loved horses all my life since I was tiny. That's all, I didn't play with Barbies. I played with horses. Probably the incessant request for a pony as a small child and my parents rather than giving in to that, kept handing me plastic ponies for Christmas and for birthdays, and relatives decided this was an easy thing to provide as gifts. We'll just get Eleanor a horse. That's where it all begins, is that little girl who loves horses, may not even know why she loves horses, but she's enamored by their beauty, by their strength, by their power, and um, sees a model, uh, a briar model of a horse, a running horse like Cigar, and imagines herself, you know, owning this horse, racing this horse, riding this horse. There's a horse who lives where the wind blows strong. There's a horse who's wild and free. No one else can ride that horse. He's the horse that waits for me. There is a horse waiting for you, a genuine briar bread horse. And no matter which briar bread is your special horse, maybe, just maybe, he's waited long enough for you. Briar, shouldn't you have a briar bread to call your own? Some people do take this way, way, way too seriously. Yes, they do. <laughs> uh, my first model horse was actually a bull. And it was uh, when I was five years old. We lived on a Black Angus farm, and the people who owned the Black Angus farm gave me a briar Black Angus bull for Christmas. Well, I've always had model horses. My parents used to buy them for me when I was little. I started collecting when I was about three years old, so it's 23 years now. I actually got that one on the stand over there um, for my eighth birthday for my best friend. And I didn't know for about 20 years what it was, but it's okay. a very valuable piece. <laughs> it's very rare. Well. I still have my very first one. My dad bought it for me when I was about six years old. I still have it. It's a little black and white pinto pony. And it sits at home. He, you know, he'll never go anywhere because my dad got him for me. Uh, it's a hobby my daughter got me into when I, she was about five years old. She got her first model horse. And when she was about nine, she convinced her dad and I to take her to a model horse show. And it was the first time I'd ever seen a model horse show and I fell in love with the performance classes, all the uh, tack and miniature things. I love to make stuff. So this became an instant fascination. And as I got a little bit older, I found out about a network of people that collected horses. Probably model horse collecting started with Briar back about 1950. My dad, Sam Stone, was the fellow that made the very first model horse. And he was the founder of the Briar Molding Company in Chicago, Illinois. In 1950, they made a horse to be mounted on a uh, mantle clock uh, for a customer. And uh, the customer decided that the clock wasn't selling very well. So in lieu of payment, he gave the uh, molds to my dad and to the Briar Molding Company. Hence, they made a horse. They went to New York. They uh, sold the first horses to the F.W. Woolworth Company and didn't think much about it, but then several months later, the buyer called and said, the horses are selling, make more horses. <laughs> oh, that, was, that was in 1950, I was 10 years old. I was 11 years old when I found out about this hobby, and I found an issue of the magazine, the Model Horse Show is Journal, which was like the first magazine for model horses. And there were magazines and there were horse shows that were held in people's backyards, it's 25 years ago, in people's garages in the backyards. Through the 60s, friends would find out, gee, this person collects, and folks would get together to show what they had collected, what pieces they had, and they started literally backyard competitions. 
there'd be, you know, four or five friends, and they'd take turns judging and, and stuff. And that's how model horse showers started. And then you started to progress up to say, well, that horse would be nice maybe in a different color. So you'd start repainting, and then maybe you'd put on hair, manes, and tails, and then it kind of grew and grew and grew. A briar horse is the beginning of a thousand history lessons, of a love for nature, of an appreciation of all that is beautiful. A briar horse can take you to lands you've never known and dreams you've never dreamed. Capture a briar and let your imagination play. And during the 1970s and 1980s, those backyard shows began to turn into more competitive, albeit friendly events, where people would start getting their parents to drive them in, and then when they hit 16, they'd do the driving. Then it, it really became a larger hobby where people would rent the local fire hall or the church basement, and maybe 15 or 20 people would come. And then you'd have two people who both had repainted horses, and who did a better job? Their horse would win. So then you compete with each other, and it, and it just snowballs, and, and this is what it becomes now. It's, it's an industry. And it's gotten now, so there's some several very large model horse shows uh, in different parts of the country. The largest appeal of the model horse, and certainly the collectors especially, are the ones that can't afford or don't live where they can own a real live horse and they collect the horses and, and love them, love them like the real thing. Most little girls love to ride horses. And a lot of these collectors, as little girls, couldn't have a real horse. So this was as close as they came. Oh, my, when I was a kid, my parents wouldn't let me have a real horse. And I wanted a real horse so bad. And so I, collect, I started collecting the Briars. Briar's mission and vision in life really is to celebrate the horse. Um, all the different aspects of the horse, the beauty, the grace, the power. Briarfest is the annual gathering of model horse collectors and other horse lovers at the Kentucky Horse Park in Lexington, Kentucky. Everywhere you look, you'll see all kinds of model horses and plenty of people who come back year after year to learn more about this growing hobby and to look for that one special model horse. We are really dedicated to um, the hobby and promoting the hobby and everything that we do, whether it's Briarfest, which is a huge undertaking for us. We have um, practically two staff dedicated to making sure um, all year long that that event happens. At Briarfest, you can also see some of the real horses that have been reproduced as model horses. One of the more popular horses in recent years is Hightower. This Hollywood athlete has starred in The Horse Whisperer and Runaway Bride and many other major motion pictures. Hightower is trained by Rex Peterson. Hightower is the only one I've ever been around that will get right there, get right in your face, and then you can go, whoa, that's enough. And when he comes at you, he'll make a believer in you. He is going to eat your lunch. And when he got right to him, I went, whoa. At the Holiday Inn, many collectors show off their models and sell some of their horses to a clientele that roams the hallways into the early hours of the morning. It never <laughs> stops here. For these uh, few days of, of Briarfest, it's nothing but room sales, people buying, selling, trading, talking, and it goes till probably 2 in the morning. I guess it's like Vegas. It, it never sleeps. We do a lot of realistic horses, too, and a lot of real horses. I don't happen to have a real horse on me, most of the people that we associate with in the art side of this business own a horse. It gives their art authority and credibility and authenticity. The funny thing about the hobby is I think the hobby for many people is a substitute for not being able to have a real horse, whether that's financially or, or because they're not in the best shape in the whole world. I think it's a, I think it's a terrific experience uh, for people that maybe have a love of horses, but can't ride because they're physically unable or, or can't have a horse because they live in the city or don't have the money. I used to show Tennessee walkers for real and I've always had model horses since I was a child. I don't have any real horses right now so the model horses kind of take their place. This is a way of participating in the real horse world without the opportunity to ever own your own horse. I've never had my own horse. Uh, but I've always ridden other people's and I've always used model horses as a way of 
satisfying my interest in learning more about disciplines I may never have the opportunity to do in real life. And I'm never going to have this many horses in real life because they're too big and too expensive. So this is the next best thing. And you can have any breed you want, any color you want, any, you know, anything. I think the love of horses does bring, and the desire to own a horse uh, brings people to the world of model horses, and the love of art as well. When I first started to sell model horses, they were a souvenir. They were a notion, a novelty. And we sold them to novelty notion buyers, souvenir buyers. Uh, it is through their own stimulation and their own, and they took the initiative and their own creative uh, energies, which really um, translated this into an art form. It's an art form, it is. And when you touch something and mold it and create it, they've held it with their hands and they very lovingly turn this animal about until it looks like it can breathe. I think the main thing is the satisfaction of seeing the look on people's faces when they get one of our pieces and how much they fall in love with it. I mean, when it brings tears to somebody's eyes, it's, it's a good feeling, you know? You've made somebody happy. Isha is a limited edition resin. We use polyurethane resin. My husband, Larry Backstrom, does all my casting. I actually make the molds, and he does the casting. I clean them up, and Karen paints them. So we're kind of like a team. We all do our part. We need to start off by making a mold, and the mold is, is uh, made by using RTV. It's a uh, silicone rubber. And that rubber, the way that, that Debbie designs the actual mold, is a, it's a split type mold, two piece. What I actually do is take her mold and I cast the actual uh, pieces that are gonna come out of this. Yeah, in RFID, it's a transponder that we put in each one of these horses so that if someone wants to authenticate this particular horse, trace it back to who owned it, who purchased it, uh, we can do that. We have a database that we put together. So before we actually pour the resin into it, we drop a chip into it. The finished resin comes to me and I add the personalities. I airbrush them and then I hand paint all the markings in and the artist choice ones are whatever Debbie and I want them to be. Sometimes they'll talk to you by saying, you know, you haven't done me in such and such color and I would look great in that color. <laughs> and then I'll do it in that color. When you can make somebody happy, it's just a sense of, of completeness. When I'm not involved with model horses, I'm the curator of American art at the Dallas Museum of Art in Dallas, Texas. I handle painting and sculpture from the colonial period to World War II, organizing exhibitions, delivering lectures, writing books. An awful lot of our artists that we use today to actually sculpt the models that will later become uh, models for Briar uh, are people that began as hobbyists, as collectors when they were young. With Marvelous, um, Stephanie had said she wanted to produce something for the premiere. She was thinking something in the Gruya, which is a, a horse color, and, um, and she also said that she would like it to be a Pinto. So I sat down and thought about, you know, what be a neat color of Gruya or shade of Gruya that we've not produced before. And I kind of thought I would like to do something more on the mauve end of it, kind of the, with the peachy undertones. And I decided that uh, it probably looked neat in a very minimal overall, just the, you know, the, the small body markings and some leg white. Briar model horses are made by Reeves International at their plant in New Jersey. Really ever since the Renaissance, but really since the beginning of the 20th century, art has run down two parallel tracks. We think of modern art as all cutting edge, contemporary, edgy, I don't understand it, so it must be good fashion. But there's always been a steady trend toward realism, hyper-realism, that tracks alongside it. MoMA doesn't like to acknowledge that the other one exists, but they don't really want to tell you that their most favorite painting is Andrew Wyeth's Christina's World, because that doesn't square with what they want to be. Um, we run into this all of the time in the contemporary art world. I view this as the parallel track to more abstract art that attempts to get at the essence of something. You'll see in equine images or in some of the other magazines, you will see sculpture that borders on the abstract but that tries to get at that rush of adrenaline that people feel when they're around horses. This is sort of the realistic version of that. You can either take the briar ones or the stone ones and reposition them and re-sculpt them to change the positions and make them into something totally different, or you can just work from scratch, create your own horses. They take these horses and they alter them. They'll heat them and bend them 
Um, they'll repaint them. I've seen some model horses where they've put in glass eyes uh, that a taxidermist might use in a bird, and they look alive. Well, you can move the legs forward and back. You take a heat gun and soften them up, and you can reposition them, and you can take the tails off and put resin tails on and resin manes. And, uh, oh, you can do all sorts of things. You can make this horse so you won't even recognize him with enough work. He was just a, a, a plastic model bought from Briar, as is in the box, and, I, and he was standing in a standing position, and I took him and uh, through the process of saws, dremels, sanding tools, things like that, cut him up, heated him up, dismembered him, and repositioned him totally. And this is the result, a totally new model. He took about a year in the process, off and on. Does he have a name? The Pusher. The what? The Pusher. He is made after the 1981 World Grand Champion Tennessee Walker, the Pusher CG. He's my all-time favorite walking horse, and this was I've done this in his honor. Yeah, to a certain extent, what we're doing is folk art. I don't think there's any question about that. There isn't really a category for it, but there are artists here who are striving to do the single most accurate thing they can, and then there are those people who really preach the idea that it's what's inside, not what's measurable on the outside. The proportions can be right and there's no soul. And we are finding there is a society called the Realistic Equine Sculpture Society that is trying to advance the cause of realism in the service of art, not realism in the service of function. This is a great horse because it is doing a perfect extended trot versus this is a horse that just makes you want to go out and want to go riding. And he's doing a great extended trot to boot. Hey, my name is Ed Gonzalez. Um, I'm from Durham, North Carolina. I'm a full-time equine Great. artist. Um, I sculpt for a living. You get that image in your head and you just get started and, and you see it and you just work through it and work through it. And I think the second most part would be the finished product when it actually is done and you, and you see what you saw and it came together, or maybe it didn't. <laughs> you know, and you have to go back and start all over. I do resin work, I do um, bronzing, um, just different stuff. Uh, we also do t-shirts and mugs and... So it's a matter of primary versus secondary function. There are a lot of artists who are annoyed that their horses are viewed as functional objects rather than as art. Um, but part of that is the dual trend of the hobby. Halter allows you a more artistic ex form of expression. Performance demands that art be corralled in a more narrow spectrum of realism. So sort of Philip Perlstein and Richard Estes on the one hand and Damien Hurst and whoever else on the other side. There's always gonna be that gulf where there is no bridge. And in a way, what we're doing is we're way the hell out on one end of, uh, of the bridge, sort of gazing over at what's going on over there. So, but there are a lot of aspirations in the hobby to achieve real artistry. It's like Frank Gehry, who used to make buildings that look like fish, and now it's sort of titanium bows, but the idea is the inside has to function differently than the outside, but they have to talk to each other. And in a certain way, we're fighting that same dichotomy between outside and inside in terms of what does the hobby want it to do and what does the art world want it to do. Actually, I, I don't paint. I, I don't customize like Cheryl does. I don't really have any artistic talent, at least not that I've discovered. No, I, I just buy. <laughs> well, I was a commercial person. Several of these people over the years, the early years, approached me and they said, look at what we're doing with these, these things. Look at, this is more than just a plastic horse. In 1995, uh, my wife and I uh, moved to Shipshawana, Indiana, and we started the Peter Stone Company. And uh, our goal was to be a competitor to the Briar Company. As time went on, we've developed on our own uh, right into uh, a, a different kind of plastic horse company. Now, our models are distinctive and unique because uh, they, are, they are not toys. Each one is individual. I mean, each one is unique because of the technique used in this. I mean, we have a pouring technique on this particular body, this particular paint job. So there's no telling what you're going to get as far as pattern goes. It's real diverse. This year we came out with a horse called 2001 A Space Pony. 
It um, looks like the, the heavens with little tiny stars all over it and planets, gold planets. And it's painted with a metallic blue background and on the belly of the horse is a, uh, an iridescent 2001. I think a lot of these ladies that are here have rode at one point in time. And you know, there's a bond between a woman and a horse. It's, it's just unbreakable. The relationship between, like I said, between a woman and a real horse is one thing, but with a lot of these models, of course, these models have names just like horses. I painted a little pony when her, her pony first came out, and I called him Prince Charming. I mean, he just came out so sweet, and I almost fell in love with him and started this relationship with him. I couldn't stop looking at him, and kept him next to my bedpost. Some people say that it's, um, you know, it is a cons it's a sexual connection. Other people say that it's, it's the mastery of a large animal. Uh, many people would say that it's a uh, horses respond to women uh, more so than men. There's more women riding horses out there than there are men. And um, there's something about the female and the horse. Amazingly enough, the relationship between a woman and a plastic yeah, horse no. can be just as strong yeah. as a woman and a real horse. For especially women, it's something to care for. And a horse is a masculine thing. Um, and it's freedom outside. Uh, you're outdoors in the air and in the elements. And it's a healthy pursuit, physically healthy. The connection from that live re uh, relationship to the, to the living horse, to the, to the model horse, is a very short step. It's a very short step for the, the, the female child or adult to take. Not only do they believe in them aesthetically that they're beautiful, they are, they're nice to touch, they feel good. Who knows where it comes from, you know, but um, women love horses. Not to say men don't either. There are men in the hobby. They're, it's predominantly uh, a woman's hobby, a lady's hobby. I'm not sure why, because there's certainly a lot of men that like horses. Um, I don't really know why that is. Actually, I made the mistake of uh, falling madly in love with a girl that is in model horses. So, um, so what happens is if you if you end up with somebody in this sport, eventually you're going to end up at a show. After we got married, he attended a show with me one time, and he caught the bug. <laughs> when my girlfriend first took me to a show, I was the only man there. The second show, I was basically only, there was two men there. Once you're married, you know, you're kind of hooked into it, more or less, you know. If I don't go there, she's not going to let me go fishing. So a lot of the husbands are along, sometimes because they, they have to be. There's a lot of husbands that are involved and boyfriends that are involved, but they're involved on sort of a fringe level, you know. They, they like to come, they hang out, but as far as owning their own stuff, they, they don't do that, which is too bad because they really should. One of the ladies here, her husband's gonna stay for a couple hours and he's gonna go play golf. Boyfriends are very rare, actually. You don't get too many of those because uh, they always have an opportunity to just say, no, I'm not coming and, and don't go. It's usually 20 women and me. I mean, but it's, and they like having me along and they always say, we wish we could get more men into this sport, but this is a non-contact sport right here. It's hard to get men into this. I become friendly with this family in the post, you know, in the post office. We used to get all these packages across the counter. And uh, the father came in one day and he said to me, I bet you wouldn't even believe what's in these packages. And I said, well, why? You know, he said, because they're horses, plastic horses. My daughter's a plastic horse collector. I said, you mean briars? And he said, yeah, briars. Why, you know briars? I said, well, I've got a box full of them in my, in my parents' attic. And he said, well, gee, would you like to sell that? And I was like, no, no, I've had them forever, you know? And said, I went to my parents, got my box of briars out of the attic and took them home. And in probably, Seven or eight years, my collection's grown from about 35 models to probably uh, 12 to 1,300 models. I like, for some, I'm an Oakland Raiders football fan, and I was a Dale Earnhardt race car fan, and it seems that a lot of my horses, you could see, are black and white and black and silver, and that is sort of the theme. I like mostly the darker colors. Everything has a little black in it, it seems. And what they make you do if you're a man at one of these things, it's about time to go get lunch. That's what you usually do. So you get a lot of lunch running for people and you pack and haul stuff back and forth. You're basically more or less used for muscle. But uh, I, I enjoy it because the people, the women are very nice. They're just, and of course, they carry their stuff. They're happy to have you around. And actually, um, he's very lucky. He's won several of the raffle models at Briarfest. And he, he gave me one. The raffle models are very, very collectible. Okay. So. 
I try not to get way too involved in that because you can get lost in it. Next thing you know, you feel like you're a woman with a skirt on. You're in the middle of all these ladies going, I can't believe she painted that. Well, you have to keep some masculinity and step back from it a little bit. This, I think, has brought us closer together, showing together. Because sometimes you don't have a lot of things in common. Like different, we like different kinds of music, different kinds of TV shows. But this is the one thing we really have in common and enjoy sharing together. I've noticed at this show, there's more men than I've ever seen. Of course, this is the biggest show, and these these women take this very serious. So I've kind of, you, you got to learn when you can joke and when you can kid around here because. You feel like a, a bull in a china shop. Oh, this is nationals. 335 entries. Biggest one ever. This is, this is the big time. This is the National Model Horse Show. Uh, it's called, just called North American Nationals. That's where we get the NAN from. And each individual in here has qualified their horses as a first or second place at a regional show. Uh, the NAM show, this, this model horse show, the whole concept of the model horse show, to some people would be ludicrous, but to, to people that understand the competitive nature of people that are involved with horses, whether they're real or unreal, they would have a high degree of respect for the artistic uh, qualities that, that people uh, apply to these horses. If you qualified to be a NAMSHA show, there were certain guidelines for your class list, uh, certain performance classes, certain halter classes. Costuming, uh, the tacking, um, the, the, the appropriateness of the horses for the classes, all of those things, they demand a high degree of skill and discipline. Halter is judged on the horse itself, how the paint job, how the shading is through the body. When you get into the halter, it's the same thing. Does it have the confirmation of a real horse? Um, does it have the breed type? Does it go along with the standards and everything? The breed you assign to it when you show it, it has to be correct. For example, this horse is an Arabian. Clearly, you couldn't show it as a Clydesdale, which is a big, heavy draft horse. Yes, you can do this. No, thoroughbreds don't come in that color because the gene doesn't exist in the gene pool to bring real horse information to bear in a hobby environment. The scariest thing are the ones that barely look like horses that are kind of deformed. And I, sometimes I wonder how other people can look at it and not see that its legs are all different lengths, you know? Okay. Things like that. I mean, that's my favorite thing is seeing a paint job that's done so well, you, you think the horse is almost alive. If you looked away for a second, it might run off. So the judges look, look for, you know, accuracy and um, nice paint job, you know. They don't want any goops of paint or anything like that. Um, with the original Finnish horses, they sometimes judge them on a little bit different basis. How collectible is it? Um, you know, it's for color only. It's for the finish only, for, you know, glossy sometimes in OS, or um, matte finish horses. Short stuff comes from when I was young. My grandmother bought me a set of railroad props. Among them were six horses and six cows. I took the one short stuff to a show as a joke, and wonder of wonders, it qualified for nationals. What I've been doing for the past two days at this show is I've been judging performance. So you're looking at a piece and you're, and you're trying to take in, does it look like it's doing what it's supposed to be doing? Does the tack fit? Does the rider go with the whole setup? I mean, does it look like a real scene? Could, it's, it's that kind of stuff. We judge halter horses doing the Watusi as well as standing stock still. We make allowances for the plastic world uh, but not in performance where we expect everything to be dead on. This is a Peter Stone paid run psyche. He is a regular run Peter Stone Arab. I got him probably about six months ago, specifically for this costume. Um, I needed an original finish to show this costume on. I typically show it on a custom that I have, but I thought it was good enough to put on an OF, and this horse's coloring is absolutely perfect. He does well in costume which is primarily why I bought him. Performance is costume. Rather than trying to compete with people who had the best in props and horses and who were willing to travel across country, what I really wanted to do was to help teach people how you could take an ordinary entry and do extraordinary things with it. He's very old. He was probably originally made about 10 years ago. And he wasn't aging very well, and a friend of mine decided that she would rather have the body and put a different head on it and play with the, use the body for another horse. So his head got cut off. And his head kind of banged around in a box for about a year. And then we were at a show one day, found his head, and 
decided we were a little bored and we were going to have some fun, and we entered him in a bunch of silly performance classes. We had him, he was being eaten by a dragon in one class, and he was uh, playing a part in an off-Broadway production of The Godfather in another class. And he did come here to this national show two years ago, and um, he was in colic surgery at that point. We mocked up a body for him. Um, we had a whole team of surgeons and an anesthesiologist and a surgical table, and uh, we alarmed a lot of people because we used pasta as his guts, and it smelled a little funny, and it scared people, and they were grossed out. Um, and as a result, this little horse head now has his own little fan club. He's got a website. He gets email. He answers it. An etch is when you take a solid color model and you take an exacto knife blade, a slow blade, and you just make little marks, little tiny, tiny. They have to really small. That's to stimulate hairs in there. And that's what rones him out to the dip. You can see there's some different shading in him. And it gets kind of light and it goes darker. And you just, lots of little ticks, and it takes forever. I usually find time to work on them after work. When I get home, I go downstairs in the basement and spend usually two to three hours on them at least three to four times a week. It, it's got everything. You have to have the right, the right accessories. You have to have the right um, attitude when you come out. There is some politics, which there always is when you're competing. It is a learning process. Um, I've shown horses. Like I say, I've always had horses and shown them. But there are certain detailed things as to, because the tack here has to be proper, as if it was a real horse. And things that I thought that I knew that I really didn't know when you have to go in and study and learn. So it is definitely a learning educational process, this model world. He will be in a, um, a class where he will be within a string of three mules being led through a series of barrels. Just to, to see how the mules follow the people through the barrels. I do like the competing end. And one of the reasons that I really enjoy the competing is because I make everything that I show. I make the horses, I make the riders, I make the accessories. So everything that I have up on the table is something that I did. This is what I do. I mean, I'm, I'm an artist. There are competitors who come here like Derry where you can't wait to see what they're going to put on the table because you know that they're trying to outdo themselves from the year before. And this is our national competition. Your horses had to qualify to come here and compete. So just being here is an honor. But to have your horses do well in the ring, whether you made them or not, is a, you know, it's an advantage. And, and people really look forward to it. And they, they spend all year getting ready for this competition. There's that upper half a percent that competes against themselves as individuals. And then there's sort of a whole pyramid down below that of trying to rise up the competitive levels until either through straight competition or through tack making or customizing, you actually achieve a level both of recognition and talent and sophistication that you become the, the top of the heap. I'm very proud of this little fella because I'm at the North American National Championships and this little guy just won reserve national champion. And, I, and he's such a cute little thing. This is my first national champ and it, it's amazing to know that I created something that is the best in the country and then I beat some incredible girls. It's a good feeling and I'm very proud and I can't wait to call my dad and tell him. It, it just made me want to cry. I was just stunned. It was just very exciting. Unbelievable. <laughs> Actually, the two that won the national champions, I honestly didn't think would. And the ones I had hopes for didn't. So it's, it's always, that's what brings us back to the shows. Time after time, every judge is different. Every time you go out is so completely different. You never know. It's an opportunity, I think, through judging, both to see a, a wide variety of things that are happening, to find out how creative your peers are, but also then to be able to, through clinics and teaching environments, to be able to say, but you can make it better. I love it. I, I love showing. To me, that's the essence of the hobby. It used to be collecting, but then I got such a large collection that collecting wasn't the focus anymore. Keeping my collection, of course, but then it became showing. Well, live showing, you can't just buy a model and slap it on the table. There's more to it. And it's almost like with some sports, you got to pay to play. And right here, these ladies shelled out lots of money to be in this arena. And usually, the most expensive horse with the most expensive costume is going to win. Some people show uh, performance, 
and but I don't do that. Um, a lot of the performance getups cost as much as a new model, so I'd really rather have something a collectible new model than to spend four or five hundred dollars for a fancy uh, Arabian costume. It's serious, people. I didn't realize how serious the money was. A lot of people say about my chinas, you know, it's I can't believe you bring them because some of them are very valuable. It, if I can't share them, you know, it's why well, have them really? When I first started coming to these things, and you walk past the table, and you know my girlfriend or somebody point over and point to a horse, I go, "That's a pretty horse. It's three thousand dollars." And this thing's sitting on a wooden table right there, and anybody could either swipe it, knock it over, break it. Oh, the worst thing is if a horse falls off the table. Oh God! A whole table of china's fall over and start <laughs> breaking. You know that's not good. When they break, it's it's in a million tiny pieces, and you can't do anything. My husband hit one with a bucket of spackle, and it just went into a zillion little pieces. And I mean, it's it's a very devastating thing. And everybody's like real silent for a while. And oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh God, you will hear this room. Someone drops a horse. Dead silence. I'll tell you, earlier today, someone dropped their digital camera, and the room will go silent for a few seconds because you hear something hit the floor, but you don't know what it is. Now, I'm sure, I know it's a very expensive digital camera because it's the lady that's doing our online photography right now. And everybody went, oh, it's just a camera, okay. So, oh, yeah, when it happens, everybody just gets really quiet and... It's, it's a horrible sound. It's something you never want to hear. It was in California. I don't remember the exact show. And somebody bumped the table, and there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of the China horses on the table. And they just sort of started doing the domino effect. They all went thump, 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 thump. And they lost probably about a third of the table to broken legs and stuff. It wasn't good. <laughs> and it's, it's uh, uh, you know, like losing a, uh, like losing a pet or a, a some pieces can't be repaired, and a lot of pieces are irreplaceable. And this particular color was only made for six months back in the 1950s. And that's why some of these are so unusual and hard to come by, because how many China horses have survived for 45 or 50 years? You'll see people are so wonderful about that. It's like when I hit the table or in the Arabi costume. I hit my leg on the table, yeah, and everybody kept really mad at me. I almost cried my eyes out, and I still had the same husband too. So <laughs> I kept, I, I lost the horse but kept the husband. These chinas are so fragile, you gotta be so slow and careful moving them and stuff. Showers are pretty funny, they have very careful about transporting their collections and stuff. They will um, have individual boxes for each piece. They won't check them through as baggage unless they have uh, basically formal type shipping crates, pieces are packed wrapped in, in bubble wrap and packed in foam and um, it's it's a, a major undertaking. Folks tend to drive here as opposed to flying because of transporting their horses. My friend Teresa who I travel typically with, she had five horses break in on transit, her resins, they had broken legs and that's that's pretty uh, pretty upsetting when they're worth several hundred dollars. Um, that trip I had two horses break myself. So, it's pretty expensive when they break. I just can't get over the amount of money that flows in and out of this sport. I think it's probably very unusual for somebody who's not involved in it just to just to think of the, the money that people put, put into their collections that they then take and travel around with. I mean, a lot of people would say you spend $600 for a horse, leave it at home, don't take it anywhere. And yet people do, they take them, they buy them, they enjoy them, they compete with them. That's one of the things that's most shocking when you see somebody walk up and not blink an eye and buy a $2,000 model horse. I mean, and, and walk off and they just, if I can win with it, they'll pay it. Whatever it takes to win, the competitiveness with these women are incredible. We're the generation that grew up with Briar as a molding company, for instance. Um, we had them as cheap toys when we were little kids, and now we're 40 years older, we have disposable income. Near the horse park, the Stone Horse Company sponsors a model horse auction of highly prized, specially made models. There's a list of people here with credit cards that are maxed and it will come down. You know, if I got $5,000 left on a credit card, I'll max it, get that horse, and I'll win with it. And that's what keeps this sport going. It's an industry, I and mean, I, I make a good living. 
making model horses. That, that's it. It's the money. It's the money that fascinates me. Because I'm thinking, you know what I could do with $2,000, you know? But they never blink an eye when they spend it. They never blink an eye when they spend that much money. I tell my fiance all the time, if we ever go broke, we can live off my collection and my tack for two years, you know, because it's, that's how much money you put into it. The, the flow of money never stops. You know, as fast as these people can spend it, they can make it. What you're seeing is a group of people who have done well in their private lives to be able to indulge in this as a hobby. Some people eat macaroni and cheese all year long to afford a custom. Other people, this is disposable income. And a lot of these ladies are, their occupations consist of, um, you know, pharmacists, uh, doctors. Uh, some of them have businesses. We have everything, women in there, everything from the stay-at-home mom, the secretaries, we have corporate lawyers, we have doctors, we have psychologists. My day job, I work for the National Institutes of Health, um, setting up meetings to bring in scientists to review grants. I stay at home with the kids. I, I do a little bit of um, animal sitting, pet sitting. I've been living in Louisiana, um, working for the United States Army. I'm a camera person and I also do graphics. I'm a nurse at our local hospital. I work at the maternity unit. I'm an ar assistant architectural designer for a company called Centria, based in Pittsburgh. And uh, I do drafting and standards for the company. Um, I also own a farm. My husband and I raise uh, llamas and miniature horses, along with my girlfriend. When I'm not doing this, I'm an emergency room veterinarian. I work in an automobile factory, building cars eight hours a day. And then another hobby, I also breed and show chihuahuas, so my hours are full. <laughs> when I'm not showing model horses, I work at the National Zoo. I research uh, background information for exhibit labels that visitors read when they come to see the animals. It's sort of an amazing leveler, uh, reminding you that the differences aren't as profound as you think between California, New York, and corporate lawyer and housewife. We're all here. I work at KFC. I got out of the hobby in college. A lot of us do. We sell off what we have. We're done. We're mature. And then we dive back in. And when we come up for air, we have more models. We also have more money. Um, we no longer have our parents nattering about where we're going to put them all. My girlfriend alone has a room with, you know, maybe three or 400 horses in there. Um, I have walked in some of these other ladies' houses, and they have bigger rooms. There's more horses. And then that's how I start. You only should buy and collect what you love. There's not enough money, time, or space. I have only over 900 in my collection. I have what's known as a black hole collection. What comes in does not come out. At one point, I think I had over a thousand models. I'm, I'm down now to probably about 400 or so. When you ask them a specific horse, they can walk over and pull it off a shelf. They can tell you when they bought it, who they bought it from, who painted it. Each woman has specific horses they're close to. The rest of them, they, they trade off and on just like Beanie Babies. But there's certain horses that they have that they'll never get rid of. With all the magnificent breeds of horses in the world, it's nice to know they all have one place to call home. At Briar. Capture a Briar and let your imagination play. Briar Model Horses, available at toy and tack stores everywhere. Well, you have your favorites. Um, certain ones can do certain things, you know, they can perform in many different classes. But uh, then you have your favorites with a sentimental value, like, or, you know, to a real horse. You have a sentimental value of a real horse, and then you create that in a model, and it kind of has that personal value to it. Some, some people, the, the horses are like their children. I mean, they're, they can't separate that, it, you know, obviously it's a hobby and it was started out to have fun. I mean, it, it's, they have personalities, you know, people put, they, they impose personalities on their, on their horses. I mean, I even do it to a certain extent, you know, but I mean, not, not to the point that it's, you know, out of hand. hand. Everybody has their favorite from when they were kids and it doesn't matter how loved up it is. That's still your favorite horse. Oh, I'm very attached to them. 
by Betsy Grubb. Well, I have a lot I would never part with that my parents bought me when I was a little girl. Could never, never like a, the, those go sentimental reasons. This is Jethro. Yeah, my, my buddy. This is my all time favorite horse, actually. Jethro is the reserve champion um, in Appaloosa Geldings and Mares, and it means so much to me that he did as well as he did. This is my boy, and it really means a lot. He is, um, when he loses, I cry. I, am, I just, I love him that much. And everybody loves their collection. I don't, you know, some of these horses didn't place, and I don't care if a judge didn't think they were great. I love them, and I'd never get rid of one of them. I thought, oh, I'm gonna sell these old ones and get new kitchen counters. Well, now I've got 900 more. So you ju I, just, I just love it, just absolutely adore it. It's, it's fun, I mean, to me, this is the most stress-relieving thing in the world. Just being able to go into my workroom and escape from, you know, the, uh, the telephone ringing or, you know, work calling, wanting me to come in and work extra hours or something like that. It, it's just very relaxing doing all of that. We see our strengths as creating beautiful representatives of the horse world and all the equine heroes and being able to bring that to all different types of horse lovers, whether they're the kids or the adult collectors. You know, the hobby's gotten so incredibly professional and big. You know, it's gone from being a backyard show thing to being a national event. And now it's really become, in less than 10 years, a very large uh, thing. This year we have 335 showers. Over 6,000 model horses have come. But uh, I don't think this sport's going to shrink any. It's just, this thing, it's, it's getting bigger and bigger, and the money's getting bigger and bigger. And, and depending upon your schedule, you could go to a model horse show every weekend of the year almost now across the country. They're everywhere. I like socializing with people that have the same bizarre interests that I do. It's, it's a personal enjoyment. Um, I do this because I like to, not because I have to. It's a social aspect. I mean, and I, I travel from, from Connecticut by car, you know? I mean, it's all these people. I mean, for being involved for such a short time, I know a lot of people, and I've met a lot of friends. Even if the hobby were to die tomorrow, would be friends for the rest of my life. And that's really what it's all about to me. I just enjoy the shows, not only because of the competition and seeing everybody else's, but I enjoy visiting and catching up with old friends and me making new ones. Everyone is incredibly generous with helping, with guiding you, with helping you understand what a good model is versus what a good model is not. Well, I've made so many friends through this hobby. In fact, two, my two roommates I met through this hobby many years ago. Um, also, I travel around the country a lot. I go to judge a lot of shows and, and meet a lot of people there. Um, it's great, kind of a social life. In this group of people, um, it's so easy to make friends. and. You know, sometimes we don't see each other for, for a whole year. We'll just see each other at one event. But we're still very close and we're very, you know, we talk a lot. You know, we spend a lot of time on the computer, sometimes on the phone, um, chatting back and forth. And, and, and it's not just about the horses. You become involved with the people, too, and what's going on in their lives. And that's, that's a big bonus when you get to become a part of somebody's life. I mean, I love meeting the people. Otherwise, that, I get kind of... Law, I feel like I'm in limbo land after a while. Everybody I work with looks at me like, you're nuts. One of those wacko little corners of the world, you know, that nobody knows about, and, and, you know, unless somebody would tell them. You know, people look at me cross-eyed when I tell them what my hobby is. They just can't, they can't compute it. They don't understand. They're like, why? Why do you spend that much money? But, you know, I love it. It makes me happy, so that's why I do it. Well, I, I really feel that, um, being a part of this world is a nice thing, and um, I think that's part of the attraction, this whole universe of the model horse world. Wherever we go across the country, we have friends. It's, it's like belonging to a very special club. There are a lot worse things that a kid can spend their money on than plastic horses. Kids get into this, this is something different to focus on than your, you know, normal sex, drugs, and rock and roll. They get a lot of support. We don't have drug troubles in the model horse. You spend it all on little horses. Actually, it's a great sport, and I think it's great that they get the smaller kids in it. The kids here, for such small kids, they're not rambunctious because they know how much money sets on these tables. It's a very good introduction to 
a lot of different aspects of your real world life. I mean, there's a business avenue, there's a competitive and attitude, there's an um, artistic and avenue. And I think it's a great hobby for people because like, there's so many aspects of it. I mean, when I was a kid growing up, believe it or not, I actually learned more skills in this hobby that actually prepared me for getting a real job than I did pursuing a four-year degree in art school. I would just really encourage um, young people that get, are getting started in this hobby, start small. You own, you know, just collect what you love. And but don't put them in a yard sale 10 years later. It's something that all, all members of the family can participate in, uh, particularly uh, moms and their daughters. Very few kids or adults have two or $3,000 for one of these limited editions that only 15 of would be made. But most kids can save their allowance for a little while and scrape up $15. You get to um, get a chance to win ribbons and sometimes other models too. When we're at local shows, oh, we have a good old time. We, we, we you know, we might win some ribbons. We might win a plaque, but by golly, we're gonna have a good time. We're here to have fun. This is what I do to get away from the pressures of my job and the rest of my life. And I don't wanna be stressed out here. It keeps me from going nuts, I guess. Well, I suppose that's probably debatable. <laughs> I have seven nieces, nephews, and godkids, and I get something for them every year for Christmas that they can break and play with, but I always give them a briar horse, too, that they can collect. And maybe when they're old, they can sell it and get new kitchen cabinets, too, huh? It's a wonderful hobby. I mean, I'm just so proud to be a part of this hobby. Oh, yes, it, it's a hobby, but it's a serious hobby. You know, it, it's not just plastic horses.